The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so let's get started. So before I get into any poker, I want to talk about the, the mentality I want everyone to try to have when analyzing poker in this class. So I call it the decision mentality. So I'm going to start with a story. Um, who here has heard of credit card roulette? It's like a game you play at the end of uh, going to restaurants. So what happens is poker players, they're going to split the bill by, instead of everyone paying your own bill, which is annoying, right? You have to like keep track. You might have to Venmo people after the exact amount. And sometimes the waiter or waitress doesn't want to split the bill per person. So poker players get around this by just picking one person at random to pay the bill. And you know we like making this exciting. So what we do is we ask everyone to put in your credit card, and then we pull out the credit cards one at a time. And if your credit card is pulled out, then you're safe. And the last person in has to pay for the whole table. Um, so yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty fun game. Um, I think, yeah, I think I'm pretty lucky at it. The biggest one I've lost was in Hong Kong. I once had to pay around 1,200 USD. It was a pretty big table. Um, but overall, I, I'm pretty good at this game. Um, it's a game of skill for sure. So, um, all right, so, but sometimes this results in some funny stories with non-poker players. So this is something that happened to some <coughs> poker players. Um, so Poker Pro Matt, he goes to dinner with Poker Pro Steven, and then Matt brings Emily, who's a close friend who he also has romantic interest in. So when the bill comes, Matt's like, okay, I'm going to pay for Emily. Um, so he puts in two credit cards. He's like, the second credit card is for Steven, is for Emily. And then Steven pays for himself, so Steven puts in one credit card. Um, so they cre play credit card roulette. And then Matt, being a very lucky guy, pulls out both of his credit cards before Stevens, and Steven ends up paying for all three of them. Um, okay, so now the question is, who should Emily thank? <laughs> so, um, just, so who would you thank if you were in Emily's shoes? Matt. Matt. Uh, does anyone want to say thank Steven? Yeah. Okay, because Steven actually paid for the meal, right? So I think it's totally reasonable thing to do as a reasonable person to thank Stephen to actually have to follow his wallet. Um, so in this class, we want everyone to think in terms of expected results and not actual results. So Emily should be thanking Matt. Because on average, Matt put in the card for Emily. And on average, um, Matt is going to be paying for Emily. Because Matt's going to be paying the one third of the time that Emily would be paying. But at the time, um, Emily thanked Stephen for her meal and then didn't say anything to Matt. And then Matt was upset about it and told the entire poker community. And that's all I found out about this story. Okay, so, right, so we want to think about in terms of, ex on average, what your decision would have had, what would have made, whether you would have made money in expectation or on average. So, roughly, the law of large numbers says over your lifetime, the amount you end up paying from credit card roulette is the same as you would have paid from splitting the bill. So, you know, why split the bill? You might as well just save a lot of time by playing this fun game every single time. And over your lifetime, the amount you pay in credit card roulette is roughly going to be what you would have paid from splitting. Um, and so, yeah, so all randomness eventually averages out to its expected value. That's what this is saying. Um, so what does eventually mean? So basically, when we say a gamble is very risky, I'm not mathematically defining anything here, but um, I just want to throw out some intuitive concepts. So a risky gamble is a gamble where it takes a long time to converge at your expectation. But the point is, no matter how risky it is, eventually it'll get you. So poker players, so there's a saying that like death, taxes are the two things that eventually get you. Um, as poker players, we like to think that three things eventually get you. It's death, taxes, and the law of large numbers. Well, eventually, you're going to reach your long run. Okay, so, so here's another hypothetical situation. So let's say you get off at the wrong bus stop because you were distracted. And then you're upset yourself. You analyze how to not get distracted in the future and get off at the right bus stop. But then after you get off at the wrong bus stop, you find $1,000 on the ground. And then you immediately, you're no longer upset and you're, you marvel at your riches. So this is sort of an absurd story. But situations like this happen all the time in poker. Um, you're going to make a bad decision. But bad decisions still get a good result 49% of the time. And if you make the right, right decision, you're still going to get a bad result 49% of the time. So it's very important to 
analyze your decisions without being biased by the actual outcome that uh, that occurred. So you really want to be obsessed with this like self improvement, analyzing your decisions. Um, you know, if you made like ten thousand dollars in a situation where you could have made twelve thousand, then that's not good enough. So I want everyone to think in terms of you know what's the maximum you could have made and analyzing what's the best decision you could have possibly made in every situation. And sometimes it's hard, right? Because if the result is exactly correlated with the decision, then you can just go back and look at the result and know whether you made a good decision or not. But that's why learning poker can sometimes be very, very hard because you don't have immediate feedback. You're not sure whether the decision you made was is what caused you to make that money or you just got lucky. Okay, so with that being said, so now let's talk about some ways to reason about poker hands. So roughly there's three levels of reasoning in poker hands. Um, so level one is my hand versus your hand. So but by this I mean you, you can see what your cards are and you look into your opponent's eyes and you say, okay, I can tell your cards must be pocket kings or whatever. Your hand, your hand must be this other hand. And you play your hand exactly against your opponent's specific hand because you have a soul read on them. So, all right, so let's see an example of this. Um, so we'll watch an episode of Poker After Dark here. Raise the 1200. No longer I pray to it. <laughs> I think you would call it the Sam Patrick. Sure. Button race is never anything. Contrary to what Patrick court, might court think, court Jennifer court. has a real hand, and it just got better. She's flopped top set. Patrick flopped a pair of tens with a gut shot straight draw. Get <laughs> I thought you had pocket kings. I was like, I almost thought I had to. Okay, so so yeah, so this is a sort of well-known poker fan from way back in the day. Um, if you're a Jennifer Tillingham, I'm sorry if I'm making fun of her. Um, but basically, right, so she put her opponent on a specific hand. She looked at Patrick Antonius and had a feeling that he had pocket kings for some strange reason. And then what happened was, so she has pocket jacks here, um, which is a really, really good hand. It's a full house. And she just checked the turn and checked the river instead of trying to get Patrick to put more money in um, because she was so certain Patrick had pocket kings. And, you know, just mathematically speaking, out of all the possible combinations of cards you could have, to put your opponent specifically on pocket kings in this example is um, basically unfounded. So this gets to level two reasoning. So level two reasoning is my hand versus your range of hands, versus your probability distribution of hands. And another name for this is exploitative play. So let's look at a different hand, and I'm going to show you how to reason about this hand using level two exploitative reasoning. So, okay. So I'm not going to go through the whole hand, but this is actually a real hand I played in Macau about five, six years ago. So we get to the river, and I have ace-10 in the in this situation. Um, so the pot is 21,000 roughly, and my opponent bets 8,000. Sorry, so, so the pot is 21,000 after my opponent bets 8,000. So basically, the pot was 13,000, and my opponent bet 8,000, making it 21,000. And I have to decide whether to call. With a pretty good hand, I have a pair of aces here. 
But I know my opponent is Rain Khan, who's a very tight player and doesn't really like bluffing. So I don't think he's really ever bluffing. If I'm beating him here, it's because he's betting a hand that he thinks is good, but is actually worse than mine, like Ace-8, basically. Um, so I model my opponent's range as Ace-King through Ace-8. I don't think he has something even stronger, like pocket nines, because he would have raised more earlier in the hand. Um, but basically, okay, so let me, let me run through this calculation sort of slowly for those of you seeing pot odds for the first time. So here, basically, I want to think of it like this. The pot, which includes the 8,000 he just put out, is 21,000. We're considering calling for 8,000. So if we lose, if we call and he turns out ace-king, which is a better hand, then our net result from this decision is negative $8,000. If we win, we get our 8,000 back, as well as the 21,000 in the pot. So we make our net is plus 21,000. So therefore, our win to lose ratio needs to be at least 8,000 to 21,000 in order for calling to be positive expectancy. So, all right, so we'll do the exact calculation. I'll try to do it somewhat slowly to show an example of how to do this calculation. So essentially what I do is I count the combinations of, um, I, can't, I count the combinations of each hand that exists. So ace-king, there's eight, combi ace, king, there's eight combinations because there's two aces remaining that I haven't seen and there's four kings remaining. So it's two times four, there's eight combinations. Same with ace-queen, ace-jack, and ace-eight. Ace-10 and Ace-9, there's only six combinations each because I have a 10, which makes him having Ace-10 less likely. And for Ace-9, there's a 9 on the board. So Ace-9 is also slightly less likely. Um, so Ace-10, we actually get half the pot. So I'm just going to roughly, uh, I'm going to uh, make that equivalent to us winning three of those times and us losing three of those times, which is equivalent in expectation. So basically, if you do this counting, there's 33 combinations that beat us. Um, there's 11 combinations that we beat. And so our equity is basically our probability of winning, which is equivalently the fraction of the pot that we own. Um, so our equity in this case is 25%. And the pot odds are 21 to 8. And then so we need, we need basically 1 over... 3.56. So 21 to 8 is 2.56 to 1. We need equity 1 over 3.56 to call, which is 28%, which we don't have, so I fold it. Um, oops. Uh, sorry. So, so, un so unfortunately, this calculation is a bit ugly. You just have to do it a bunch of times and convince yourself that you're doing the right calculation. Basically, you got to remember to add 1 when you're converting the odds ratio to an equity. But it's... Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it should be fairly simple math. But um, so in this case, I, I folded because I didn't have the desired equity. Um, so is there any questions about that? That was maybe a bit confusing, but I don't know of a great way to, I don't know of a great way to sort of show the exact conversion from pot odds into equity. But I just want to point out that they're slightly different. Just one is, one is a ratio of win to lose, and one is basically a fraction of win over all possible outcomes. So just don't get confused by this. That's all I'm saying. I'm going to sort of quickly interchange between the two throughout the course, and you should try to get in the habit of being able to quickly compute between the two. Um, okay, so this is an example of level two reasoning, and hand reading is about using your opponent's past actions and your knowledge of their tendencies to tweak your probability distribution of, over what you think their hand is. So hand, reason, hand reading is not about pegging your opponent on a specific hand. Um, so, you know, it's sort of a marketing message. Poker players, they wear sunglasses. They have earplugs to prevent people from reading their soul. I mean, it matters a bit, but really these things, you know, things like I scratched my ear before I raised, it should affect your belief about my cards a very small amount, way less than what Lady Gaga and the media makes it seem like. Okay. So I, so that's sort of how you reason about a hand exploitatively. You build a model for how your opponent behaves, and you make the decision that's the most positive expectancy against that model. And you can go very, very far with level two reasoning. Um, you know, you can basically build a career out of level two reasoning. And it's best targeted towards individual opponents with specific tendencies that you're trying to take advantage of. So, okay, so this sounds very good, right? This sounds like a great, great way to play poker. I. I figure out what my opponent's doing, right? I, I just I figure out the probability distribution and play in a way to make the most money from him. So, does anyone have does anyone have any uh, problems with this type of reasoning? 
So, okay, so I've got some $20 uh, Amazon gift certificates from uh, Acuna Capital. If someone can point out potentially something you don't like about this type of reasoning, uh, I'll, I'll give you this gift certificate. Uh, yeah. That's you it. reveal a lot of information about what your hand is when you think like this. You, right, but what if your model incorporates the fact that they're going to behave based on what they think is in your hand? Yeah. Well, I mean, it might take you a long time to build this model, and if players leave your table or whatever, like, you, you spend, like, because before you have the model, you can't use this line of reasoning. Right. So it's expensive to, like, do it. Right, right, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. So, so first of all, yeah, this, so first of all, level two reasoning is not easy. Even though it has flaws, even playing very good level two poker is not easy. Building the model can be very hard, and you could be wrong, yeah. But that's not really what I'm looking for. Um, yeah, I call it, yeah. Um, because if he, if your opponent knows your reasoning, then he could maybe bet a certain way to push it to 28%, where you would only call if it's... Right, okay, okay, yeah. Um, okay, I think that'll be good enough. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this to you. I'll give it to you at the end, okay? Um, right, so, so essentially, so essentially, yeah, the problem is, the, so it's this assumption, the fatal flaw in every plan is the assumption that you know more than your enemy. Does anyone know where this is from, by the way? If you do, I'll, I'll have another $20 gift certificate. Does anyone know where this phrase is from? Uh, yeah, is right, from, right. From uh, Clausewitz? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. The Lots of No. Okay, it's okay. If no one knows, I'm going to keep the gift certificate. Okay, no, it's okay. Um, all right, so essentially, the problem with this line of reasoning is your opponent does not play according to a fixed static algorithm. They're also an intelligent human who's taking this class, who's building models for you and adapting the strategy to beat you, right? So if you assume your opponent plays with a fixed strategy, but what if they're doing the same for you? So, so now I'm going to get to the third level of reasoning, which I call um, optimal play. So let's analyze the exact same hand using level three reasoning. So don't get me wrong, level two reasoning is great. If you can do level two reasoning very well, you can make a ton of money. But level three reasoning is a completely different way to analyze this hand that can also make you a lot of money. So, okay, so level three reasoning, I'm gonna think like this. Instead of thinking, so level three is my range of hands over your range of hands. So instead of looking at my specific cards and figuring out what my cards are, I'm actually gonna also put a dis probability dis distribution over myself and ask myself, to my opponent's eyes, what is the probability distribution of my hands? And in this specific spot, let's just say I decide that my range in this spot is ace-jack through ace-seven. So not including ace-nine. It's basically ace-jack, ace-ten, ace-eight, ace-seven. So this is the way I do the calculation. So I, let's just assume I know my opponent's propensity is to bet one, one over 1.6% 1 of the pot on the river. Uh, so roughly in this spot, so, so the pot was 13,000 on the river, and I know that my opponent's going to bet 8,000. Um, so, and so I must call with the frequency such that their EV from bluffing is zero. So that's essentially my goal with optimal play. So essentially what I'm saying is, let's say they have a really bad hand. They have like jack 10 for jack high, which is almost certainly going to lose the pot if they, if they don't bet to try to get me to fold. Then... I want to call with the frequency such that with those hands, regardless of whether they bluff, their expectation is zero. So how do I do that? I just make my call to fold ratio 1.6 to 1. Um, sorry, in all these computations, to make it easier, I'm assuming uh, I'm rough. 1.6 is like approximate for the ratio. It's, it's actually 13 over 8, but I chose... Uh, it actually turned out to be mostly Fibonacci numbers, so the ratio is around 1.61 for all of them. So I'm making that shortcut. Okay, so my call to fold ratio needs to be 1.61, so that if they have a bad hand, their expectation from from bluffing is zero. It doesn't matter whether they bluff. So if I do this calculation, then then Ace 10. Sorry, there's a typo. Ace 10 is definitely in the top. 61.5% of hands I can call have, so I need to call. 
Okay, so I'm not building a probability model for them. What I'm essentially saying is, if I'm not calling ace 10 here, then they can exploit me by bluffing too much, and I'm just folding all my hands here, and they're going to be able to make money off of me. To prevent this, I must call ace 10, which is a 61.5 percentile hand in my range, so that they can't exploit me. So I'm going to make an analogy with RPS. So rock, paper, scissors. Does everyone know how to play this game? So you either throw rock, scissors, or paper. So there's no ambiguity with this game. Right? I know people, if you grew up in a different background, you might call it something else, or you might have different rules. But the rules I play with is rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, and paper beats rock. OK, so, so exploita exploitative play, you think like this. You say, since my opponent just played rock three times in a row, I think they're probably not going to play at Brock a fourth time in a row. So I'm going to play scissors because I know I can't beat B. Optimal play just says I'm going to memorize a sequence of random bits and always play each of rock, paper, and scissors with probability of third. So this is an analogy with rock, paper, scissors. And so one question I often get is, you know, if when you play optimally, you're making all your opponent's decisions the same, then your opponent essentially is never making a mistake because regardless of what they do, it's the same. Um, then how do you even make money playing optimally? So in rock, paper, scissors, that's true. You know, if my strategy is just play rock, paper, scissors, each with probability a third, I'm never going to beat you more often than I should. But um, in poker, there's enough opportunities to essentially be inconsistent. For, for example, like sometimes you'll see players fold 7-6 um, suited, and then because later they're like bored and feel like playing a worse hand, they'll like call 6-5 suited in the exact same situation, which is like basically making a strictly dominated strategy, or like check raising a strictly inferior range. Essentially, the theoretical optimal strategy will still extract money slowly from even the best players, because even the best players in poker right now, there's going to be slight inconsistencies that are not theoretical, theoretically optimal. So essentially, okay, so this, so the optimal strategy, another way to think about it is a Nash equilibrium, if you've heard of the term, because the best response to the optimal strategy is the optimal strategy itself, whereas the best response to any exploitative strategy is going to be a different strategy. Whenever you play an exploitative strategy, you stand to be beaten by a different exploitative strategy that re-exploits you. So, um, so, yeah, so this is the difference. Optimal play is you play each with the same probability. Um, optimal play, you're indifferent to your opponent's move. So optimal play, you're making a lot of money when your opponent does something strictly suboptimal, whereas in exploitative play, you make a lot of money when you're winning the mind games, and you lose a lot when you're losing them. You know, so it's exploitative play is sort of like, I know that, you know that, I know that, you know that, I know this. But you know that, I know that, you know that, I know that, you know that, I know this. So basically, it's, it's, you get into these mind games, and if you're good at them, then it's pretty good, right? If you're playing rock, paper, scissors against a four-year-old child, Probably you don't want to play optimally. Probably you want to like look at their face and try to figure out what they're going to do and try to beat them, right? But if you're playing rock paper scissors against the rock paper scissors world champion, which there is one actually, um, then probably you just want to memorize a sequence of random bits and play each with a probability of third. <clears throat> so another good thing about exploitative play is it's intuitive. You know, we're sort of we sort of grow up thinking in terms of exploitative play, right? I think. I think that's a fair statement. You know, in most things, it's like, what do you think might happen? Okay, if that might happen, okay, I'll do this. But optimal play is sort of a weird mentality because it's sort of like, I don't, I, I'm just gonna analyze what my opponent could potentially do. So you need an opponent essentially, and then I'm just gonna perform an action that sort of makes it so that my opponent can't really beat me. Okay. So that's enough about those two general concepts. I'm going to take a short break right here since it's a good time. So I'm going to continue. Um, and yeah, we'll get into some actual poker. But first, okay, we're going to play one last game. So, okay, I'm going to play, we're going to play a game called Who's Taller, okay? Anyone can join the contest for a dollar. Okay, we're not actually having this, so don't get out of your wallets. <laughs> okay, basically, okay, so, and then the tallest person who's joined the game gets the entire pot. So all the, all the money, all the people who join the game, we're going to measure who's the tallest, and then that person gets everyone's money. Okay, so okay, let's play right now. So everyone close your eyes so that you can't look in here. Everyone close your eyes. No peeking. No peeking at how to... Okay, so I want everyone to close your eyes. Is everyone's eyes closed? Okay, so put up your hand if you want to join the contest. Put, put it nice and high so that I can see if you want to join the contest. All right, so okay, so okay, raise your hand highly. It's okay, there's no embarrassment. The whole point of poker is where 
Okay, cool. So now everyone open your eyes. Okay, so I think five people joined the... Okay, so do you, hey, guys, come down here. Let's see who would have won. <laughs> let's, let's see who would have won. Don't be shy if you joined. It's okay. It's totally okay if you lost. Um, okay, so I think the four of you... Okay, cool. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what's your name? Justin. Okay, Justin. Okay, so I think Justin would have won. So right, good job, Justin. You would have made three bucks from this game. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. So, okay, what's the point of this game? Um, the point of this game is, so from a game theoretic point of view, no one really should be playing this game. So this is only known as the KBD game if it, from game theory. So, so let's see. So how, how tall are you, Justin? Six five. Six five. Okay. So why did you play the game? Because you thought there's probably someone who's going to be like six two who might play the game, right? So, right. But if you, but if everyone knew that you know if you're only six two, you shouldn't be playing this game because someone might be six five, then you wouldn't play the game, right? Because someone else is only going to play the game if they were like six eight or something, right? So essentially, basically, once you pl so let's say we played this game again, probably only just to play. Um, but <laughs> eventually, this game always devolves to a situation where no, basically, no one is willing to join because you know that no matter even if you're like seven feet tall, you're LeBron James, you you would know that um, someone would only play this game if they were the tallest person in the world, essentially. So basically, poker without blinds, which is the money that's put into the pot at the start of every hand would essentially be like the two's taller game. So when you play poker, you want the motivation of every hand to be stealing the blinds, stealing the money that was forced into the pot without the choice of the person. So you would always fold king-king, which is the second best hand in poker preflop, if there were no blinds. So, okay, so suppose we were to play who's taller again, but I told you that I'm going to force Lee Marie to play. Okay, so then, so now we've got a game, because now even if you're not sure whether you're the tallest person in the room, if you're, if you're, if you're taller than Lee Marie, then you have a chance of winning. So that's essentially how, why we need blinds to have a game. Um, so basically, you, you want to think of, um, so you always want to think of how many chips you have in terms of the blinds. And so having $400 in front of you in a game where the blinds are $1, $2, for our purposes, is equivalent to having $4,000 in front of you in, in a game where the blinds are $10 and $20. Because essentially, everything you're wagering is relative to stealing the blinds that were forced into the game at the beginning. So in both of these situations, we say that you have 200 bets or 200 big blinds or 200 BB. Okay, so, so that's how to cal calculate your stack size. But um, what's actually important isn't stack size, it's effective stack size. So effective stack size takes into account the stack sizes of the people remaining in the pot as well. So, okay, so I'll, I'll give an example. So in this case, the, so we're the player with the ace jack, and we decided to go all in. So what is our exact stack size? So the, uh, so the big blind is 2,000, the small blind is 1,000, and we wagered in total 42,000. So what's our, what's our stack size? 21, right? It's essentially, it's around 21. It's around 21 big blinds. But we didn't really risk 21 big blinds here, did we? Um, did someone, okay, I'll give a $20 gift certificate. How much did we actually risk in some sense? Uh, yeah. I can't see quite well, but I think 12 and a half big blinds. Okay, yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Okay, I'll, I'll remember it. I'll put it here. Okay, so, right. So we only risked 12 and a half big blinds because the, everyone in front of us has already folded. And the two players behind, the small blind and the big blind, one of them only has seven and a half big blinds and the other one only has 12 and a half big blinds. Can everyone see that? So even though, you know, UTG plus two has 32 and a half big blinds could have theoretically covered us and we could have, could have theoretically taken all our money. But on this hand, because they already folded, we're essentially only risking at most 12 and a half big blinds. That's the most we can lose. So we can't be eliminated from the tournament this hand. So here's another example. Um, so here you see this guy that I'm going to call Low Jack for now. You see him go all in for 16 big blinds. 
Um, so in this case, technically, he could lose all his money because we have more than 16 big lines, and we do cover him. But you know, in reality, I'd say he's probably not, on average, risking 16 big blinds because most of the people who could call him, other than us, have way less than 16 big blinds. Does that make sense? So essentially, so there's not like an exact formula for ex effective stack size, but you want to sort of think of it in terms of you look at the stack sizes of all the people who could potentially play the hand against you, and you want to look at you know roughly how much am I going to be risking in this hand. Okay. Okay, so that's effective stack size. Does that, that makes sense to everyone? Okay. Um, okay, so the second thing I want to talk about that's very important is position. So position is basically where you are at the table relative to the blinds. So how many players are remaining to compete versus me for the blinds? Essentially, the fewer players that are left, the less strong my hand needs to be to attack the blinds. So I'm going to give names for the positions. Um, Basically, the thing that matters is how far you are from the button. So in this example with ace-jack, when everyone folded to you and you're, on the, you're the dealer, which is also known as the button, essentially, to, to steal the blinds, you just need to get through the two blinds themselves. So that's essentially two players. And then, you know, if you're one position earlier, when it was folded to cutoff, then he had to deal with three players. So you want to name everything relative to the dealer, essentially. Um, so we can just quickly go through the names. They'll get more familiar as time goes on. So um, so the first person to act is, we call them under the gun. Uh, so that's, uh, that's this guy here. And then we go around the table. It's under the gun plus one, under the gun plus two. There's, so there can be different names for the same position. Um, so in, in this specific hand, where there were only six players at the table, you, know, you could have called low jack under the gun because under the gun is the first person to act to the left of the big blind. But essentially, it's more clear to say low jack, because when you say under the gun, you have to say under the gun at a six-handed table. And then people will know, OK, that means you've got to get through five hands. But if you say low jack, it's very clear. You have to get through five hands. So um, under the gun, and then plus two, and then low jack. You can also call under the gun plus two, low jack minus one if you want, and then high jack, cut off, button. Don't ask me where these names came from. I actually have no idea. Um, OK, and then small blind, big blind. So OK, so that's position. And the importance of position is basically the, the, the later you are, the fewer hands you've got to get through to steal the button, to steal the blinds if everyone has already folded. OK, so the third thing is that matters in a poker hand is equity. So we talked about stack size. We talked about position. The last thing is actually your cards. So the equity of your cards is basically your secret height for the who's taller you. So you can think of it like that. Your cards is like your secret height. And the probability of you winning the pot, or equivalently the fraction of the pot you would win once the remaining cards are dealt, is called your equity. <coughs> so OK, I'm going to give some examples of calculating equity. Um, so here's an example where uh, it's, we get it all in on the turn. And so I, I have 5-4 of spades here. So I'm not in a great position. But let's try to count how many outs, um, how many outs I have. So does someone want to just name a river card that would help me win the pot? Seven, uh, yeah. seven of spades. Right, seven of spades. So that gives me a straight and a flush, actually. Um, so okay, so let's go along those lines. So how many spades are there left in the deck? Uh, yeah. Should be nine spades. Right, nine spades. And then how many cards help me make a straight here? Six more. Right, a seven or a two, right. So it's six more because it's, there's eight sevens and twos, but I'm double counting the seven of spades and the two of spades. So that's nine plus six, and then I actually have to subtract one more card. Does anyone see what it is? Yeah. Queen of spades. Right, the queen of spades, because that's actually a disastrous situation, um, because then if it wasn't all in, I would probably put in more money on the river thinking I have a flush and lose to a full house. Um, right, so it's 14 outs, uh, 17 plus, minus three, our equity is around 32%. It's 14 over the 44 cards that could still come. Um, OK, did that make sense to everyone? So that's one way of calculating equity. It's just a very simple probability distribution over the remaining cards in the deck that could come. And you know, if, you, if you're worried, like, you know, what if someone folded the queen of spades, so I shouldn't be counting that? Essentially, you just want to pretend that the, the cards that are in the muck, like the cards that were folded by other players, they're essentially irrelevant, because 
you know, they could have folded the Queen of Spades, but they could have also folded a, an irrelevant card like the Jack of Hearts or something. So essentially, you just want all the cards that you haven't seen. It's easier to just assume that they don't affect anything. I mean, in theory, they affect things a bit because you know, if you know that. If you know that the dealer button folded two cards, even if you don't know what they are, they're probably more likely to be really crappy cards like twos and threes rather than aces, because if they had an ace, they would have played it. But I think not worrying about that is fine. You, you don't need to worry about it. Okay, another example of equity calculation. So it's the exact same example as before, but in this case, the probability distribution isn't over cards that could come. All the cards have already come. The probability distribution is just over my opponent's hand. So, you know, this is the same calculation. We calculated our equity is 25%, and that's not a probability distribution over cards that come. That's a probability distribution over our beliefs of our opponent's hand. Okay, so example three of calculating equity. So this one you can't really do by hand. It's, um, it's let's say you get it all in preflop with uh, ace-king suited against pocket twos. And... Um, you basically need a calculator. There are certain websites that help you do this. And ace-king suited against pocket twos, if, you, if they don't have a two of your suit, is actually a very small favorite, which is kind of cool. But if they have the two of hearts, then you're actually a slight underdog. Um, okay, so, right, so, so just make sure for all the, different, all the different things equity could mean. Equity could mean a, a probability over river cards, probability over the unknown. Um, a very good calculator in general is Poker Stove, which I'll have lots of examples of in my slides, and you can download it via this link here. Right, so this is an example of using Poker Stove. So, you know, you can put in exact calculations. Like, let's say you get it in with uh, two of diamonds, two of spades, so pocket twos on a flop of five, three, two, versus a range where you know your opponent is going to have a big pair, like pocket jacks plus. You can actually run it, and your equity is 85%. Which is actually surprisingly low, I think. You know, because it seems like, you know, you've got three of a kind. They've only got a pair. They have two chances to hit one of two cards. But there's a lot of random stuff that can happen. Like, if they have aces, they can make a straight. They can make a back for a flush. Um, the board could come two more fives, which counterfeits your three of a kind deuces. Um, so this is another example of calculating equity. Right, so this is just a summary of the different situations you might want to calculate equity. And yeah, I recommend you download Poker Stove, but it's, you don't really have to. Um, and I guess one question you could ask is, you know, how do you actually do this at a table? Uh, so essentially, you just have to, if you do this a lot while you're studying about hands and thinking about poker, eventually I've been able to just memorize a lot of situations in general, what the probabilities are, or at least what the correct decision is. Okay, so now let's talk about raising to win the blinds and antis. Okay, so... The antis, an ante is an extra small bet that each player must put into the pot each hand, and these sum to around a big blind. And they come in during the later stages of a tournament, and they're inexistent in cash games. So I sort of, I sort of swept this under the rug in the earlier examples. Um, so in, uh, let me go back. So like in here, do you see the 1200 in the middle? So I actually sort of stuck this under the rug, but that comes from each player being forced to put in 200, which is one-tenth of the big blind, at the start of every hand. And if you're playing tournaments, then this will usually be the case. Antis will come in fairly soon. If you're playing cash games, where you just sit down and you can leave whenever, and you sit down and just play for uh, your own play money, then there's usually no antis. But antis actually make a world of difference in terms of what you want to do. So, it's not just uh, the stakes are bigger when there's antis, because you, know, you don't want to just think of it like there's extra money in the pot every hand, it's equivalent to the blinds being bigger. That's not true, because you also have to put in an ante. So, if the blinds were proportionally bigger to cover the antis, you would have to raise to a bigger size to try to steal the blinds. But with antis, you don't need to raise to any bigger size to try to steal the blinds. So it's actually very action driving. It's, it's very exciting. It makes it so that you basically you want to play a very wide range of hands, and you really just want to be trying to win the blinds as often as possible, because winning one pot with the antis is so big. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Alright, so the first thing I'm going to say is, you know, if you're going to start playing tournaments tonight, is if no one has raised yet, you really, you don't want to call. 
you want to raise to give yourself a chance of winning the blinds without seeing a flop. So I'd say the most common beginner mistake I see uh, poker player, beginner poker players make is not raising when no one has raised before. So in this case, it would be just calling for 2,000 and trying to see a flop. But the main issue is you're giving the big blind, they can just check and see the flop for free. Whereas if you raise, you put them to a decision and they might fold and you might just win the pot for free without having to do anything essentially. So how much do you raise when I say raise? Um, so the minimum raise size you can do is raising to two big blinds. However, this is a bit small because you give the blinds fairly good odds to make a profitable call, although it's not even that bad. So, so let me just talk a bit in general about raising big versus raising small. So the advantage of raising small is that you're risking less. Like let's say you raise and then the next person re-raises and then the next person goes all in. Right? So you know probably those two people have pretty good hands and you want to fold. If you raise to a small size, then you can fold and you don't lose that much. If, if I raise to like five big blinds, then I'm losing a lot more. But what's the benefit of raising big is you give other people worse odds to call. If I only raise to two big blinds, let's actually do this calculation. Let's say here, instead of going all in, I raise to two big blinds, which is 4,000, right? What odds am I essentially giving the big blind to call to call? Um, so think about it as, so this is actually in this very exact situation. This is a very common mistake I see beginners make, which is you, you raise to only 4,000. Uh, yeah. So there's 8,000 in the pot and they have to call 2,000, so it's 41. <laughs> Right, right. So, so it's 41, but there's also the small blind. So there's, there's actually going to be 9,000 essentially in the pot. Is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's going to be 8,800. Yeah. It's going to be 8,800, so approximately 9,000, and they only have to call 2,000 to see the pot. Does that make sense to everyone? So, it's, so the, their odds are actually 4.5 to 1. And you know, ace-jack <coughs> offsuit is a great hand, but, ace, but there's, there's no hand that ace-jack offsuit is more than a 4.5 to 1 favorite against. So in some sense, you know, it's basically even if they have jack two or whatever ace two, think of the think of the best possible case for you. You're you're still not doing better than the odds you're giving them. Okay, so but on the so on the other hand, though, you really don't want to. It is really risky to raise more than two point two five. So I'm so a reasonable rule of thumb I'd say is to raise the two point two five big blinds in tournaments. Um, I know it's pretty close to do. If you just raise the two, it's probably not that bad. Um, but roughly speaking, I think this is a reasonable rule of thumb. Uh, earlier, you could try to raise to more. I think that's sort of customary, although I don't think it's theoretically optimal. Um, you could, you, you'll often see players raise to like three big blinds, especially when you watch like pro players, they'll raise to bigger. But the main reason is because they're the better player by a lot, and they're just trying to make big pots, which is reasonable. You know, if, if you think you're, if you're trying to just play big pots and win big pots, then raising to a bigger size is fine, but I don't think there's any theoretical reason to raise to more than 2.25 big blinds in most situations. Um, other than when, like in cash games where it's where all players have a lot of money, then it's a bit different because also in cash games you're not worried about um, you're not worried about risking more because you're not worried about losing out of the tournament. But um, okay, so the other thing is instead of raising, you should just go all in if the effective stack size is 12 big blinds or less. So recall, the rationale for raising big is to prevent others from calling for cheap, but the rationale for raising small is to lose less if we get re-raised and have to fold. But 12 big blinds is sort of the point where it's small enough that you never really want to fold after committing 2.25 big blinds. So if I only have 12 big blinds, I raise 2.25, I've only got 9.75 left after, you know, even if I get, okay, fine, if I get raised and re-raised, maybe I'll fold, but even if I get re-raised once, if I'm raising in the first place, you know, my hand is going to be reasonable, like, I'm, if for the huge taller game, I'm not going to raise in the first place if I'm, like, uh, if I'm, like, five feet or something, so, um, your hand will be reasonable, um, so this is sort of beginner mistake number two, is being too scared to go all in pre-flop. So that's why this ace-jack hand, um, I actually cheated a bit. I, so technically here the effective sack size is, well the big blind has 12 and a half big blinds, um, but the small blind only has seven and a half, so I roughly said the effective sack size is less than 12 and I just went all in. Um, so that's definitely big, beginner mistake number two in tournaments, is to be too scared to go all in pre-flop. 
Um, so what your goal essentially should be, oh, uh, sorry, I should say the rule is if there's, so all of the numbers I said assume there's antis. If there's no antis, you should change it to 10 big blinds. So the threshold for going all in should be less because when there's no antis, you don't, you want to be risking less because the pot is smaller. Okay, so yeah, so overall, what you know, when I talked about position, I talked about stack size. Essentially, what I'm trying to get the point across is, if you're just starting out, you uh, players tend to make all decisions based on their cards. It's just I, like I have a pair of jacks. I see my pair of jacks on this board. I have a pair that's pretty good, and you sort of tend to ignore what the effective stack size is, how much you're wagering, and position. But experienced players, the cards actually matter much, much less to them. In fact, you know, if you're playing, if you're doing optimal play, you don't even care in some sense what your cards are. You just care what your range of cards are at that point. Um, so experienced players, they're willing to raise the blinds with much weaker hands from good positions rather than early positions. And they're going to risk going on a lot more frequently with a lot worse hands if their stack size is low. So I want you to think about that. So, so you know, if you're just starting out, that's fine. You know, if you're still trying to figure out whether you have a straight and stuff like that, that's fine. And it's totally fine if you try to play based just on your cards. But I want everyone's goal by the end of the class to be able to play based on these other factors more so than your cards. Okay, so that being said, I'm going to give you some concrete suggestions for, instead, for those of you who might want to start playing tonight of what hands you should be playing. Uh, from each position. And so here, this is, so most of the tournaments will be have nine players per table. And um, so this is going to be roughly a range I recommend to open. So these are, these are the range of hands you should be playing from the worst position. So under the gun at a nine handed table. So there's eight players left behind you who could pick up really good hands. So it's aces, kings, queens, jacks, ace, king suited, ace, king off suit, tens, ace, queen suited. Ace Queen off. Uh, so, okay, so that's basically the list of hands. So this is a, you know, th these are only premium hands, right? This is like 6.2% of hands, I think. Um, it's it's a very premium range. So note how tight this is. Um, okay, so yeah, because the thing to remember is only the best hand out of nine hands at the table is going to get the pot. When there's nine, hand, you know, the, even though the average hand is really bad. The best hand out of nine hands is always going to be pretty good. So to even think that you have a chance, you need to start out with a very premium holding. Okay, so so okay, so roughly, what do you add uh, as you go around the table? So for the second position, um, I'm going to post all these slides before the tournament start. By the way, so you don't need to feel you scramble to write all this down. Um, uh, I'm going to post it. So. So this is from the second position. Uh, I, so the, I, I put in black the hands that I would open from the previous position, and I put in red the hands that I would open from that position in addition. So you know, second position, there's one less player. Okay, I'll gamble with sevens, ace, jack, king, queen, ace, ten suited. So we'll get we'll get around the table, and then the range will will slowly increase. Um, oh, also note that. These are very conservative ranges. If you watch like high stakes poker, probably the players will open a lot more hands than what I'm recommending here. But my general experience has been when you're just starting out to play poker, it's much easier to err on the side of being too tight than being too loose. So because it's it's in some sense a lot easier to play pocket aces than seven five suited. With pocket aces, you're always going to have a pair of aces, or better, you just bet bet bet. Um, and then with seven five suited, you need to be able to bluff very carefully. You need to sometimes be able to try to get value when you just hit a pair of sevens, and it's just a lot harder. So always so the ranges I'm suggesting are very tight by most poker standards. By tight, I mean conservative. But I think that's the right side to err on when you're just starting. Um, so these are the range. Okay, so now we're going to get, as we get to the later position, so this is low jack. We're opening more hands now. Um, any two suited broadways, so that's hands like jack 10 suited, queen 10 suited. It's basically any two cards that are the same suit and both 10 or higher. Um, so maybe I should just run through this quickly. So why is being having your cards be suited good? You get the uh, flush. Right, right. So if it's suited, you're more likely to make a flush. But if you have two unsuited cards, then there's two different flushes you can make. Right, so, okay. <laughs> like if you have a queen of diamonds, ten of spades, then you can make a diamond flush or a spade flush. But essentially that, that argument is wrong because there's two reasons why it's wrong. One is it's not more likely because you need four of the suit to make the flush. And two is 
when you make the flush, it's also more obvious you have the flush. Like if there's like if you only have one diamond, even if it's the ace of diamonds, once there's four diamonds on the board, it's way more likely that you have a flush, so you're going to get paid off less. Whereas if you have two diamonds in your hand and there's only three diamonds on the board, it's less susceptible that you have a flush. Okay, so um, okay, so hijack is three to the button. So this is what I would recommend. Okay, so any pair, so pairs are pairs are pretty good. Um, any suited ace, so suited ace means any card with an, any hand with an ace and another card of the same suit. Any suited connector, um, by that I mean hands like basically two p cards that are next to each other and also the same suit, um, like ten, nine, ten of spades, nine of spades, or um, any two unsuited Broadway cards. So I do use a lot of terminology here, so yeah, please stop me if something is unclear. Um, you can Google most of these, I think, but... Uh, Okay, so, yeah, and suited connectors are good. So, like, a hand like 7-6 suited is often better than a hand like 10-6 suited, even though, even though the 10 is bigger than the 6, because 10 is sort of a small enough card where it's not that relevant, the fact that it's a big card, but the fact that 7-6 is connected and can hit a lot more straights is very relevant. Okay, so for cutoff, I'm just going to show you on poker still, because there's sort of too many to list. But the thing I want you to note is the percentage. It's 30%, right? So remember, under the gun, I recommended playing 6%. So we've multiplied what, how bad our hand could be for us to play by 5. And I think this is what I really want, to, want you to try to do. And I think what a lot of new players don't do enough is they always play the same cards regardless of your position. And then even crazier, on the button, if everyone in front of you folds, I recommend playing about 55% of hands. You know, this is huge. Uh, I want you to play... Jack three suited. Who thinks Jack three suited is a good hand, or uh, King four off suit, or Queen six off suit? Um, okay. So okay. So now, what hands do you play from the small blind if it's folded to you? Uh, so let's compare opening from the small blind to opening from the button. So so for small blind, it's a bit different now. Um, so yeah. So I should uh, so I should mention this because when you're raising from the button uh, from the dealer. If you get called, you get to act last post fall. So I'm going to talk more about this in future lectures, but this is basically called having position uh, post fall. And having position is basically good. Uh, yeah. For all these, for all these hands, are you assuming that everyone's folded behind you? Yes, yes. Um, if people haven't folded, essentially, I'll talk more about this in future classes, but essentially what you need to do if, uh, so like, let's say this guy raised and you're the button. Right? Yeah. Essentially, you need to consider what his range is and calculate your equity against his range, okay, which you can do. Completely different. Right, right. So the calculation is essentially completely different. Um, so essentially, the first guy who raised sort of just determines sort of what the barrier to entry to the pot is. Because essentially, the first guy that raises is if it's from under the gun, you know, he's telling you my range is pocket eights plus. Even if he's sort of loose, it's still going to be like pocket fours plus and like you know, queen 10 suited plus. Basically, it's saying, you know, if you're playing 8, 6 suited, then you're basically an idiot because my range is way better than that. So, essentially, the first guy who plays his hand sort of sets the tone on what, how good your hand needs to be. Um, yeah, so, yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah. So, I'll talk more about this in a future lecture, but essentially, uh, it, yeah, essentially, that's what you need to do. Uh, okay, so from the small blind, let's compare opening the small blind from opening the button. So the issue with opening the small blind is if the big blind calls, you actually don't have position post flop. The big blind gets to act after you post flop. So it's actually a lot worse in some sense than opening from the button because you don't get to act last. But it is better in the sense that there's one fewer person you get through, and also you have you have less to wager, which is actually really relevant because from the button, you know, if you want to, if the blinds are uh, sorry. If the blinds are 2,000 or 1,000, or okay, let's just take this. If the blinds are 2040, if you want to steal the blinds from the button and you want to do 2.25, you need to put in 90, right? You need to raise to 90 and you need to wager 90. But if you're raising from the small blind, you only need to put in 70 more. So you're actually paying a smaller price to try to steal the blinds. Um, 
But the factor you're out of position is a very important negative. So I'd say all these factors balance out and you can roughly play the same range of hands from the small blind as you would from the big blind. I think that's a reasonable rule of thumb. Um, but the fact that you're out of position hurts a lot less as stacks get shallower, essentially as effective stack sizes get a lot smaller. So it's, um, so you know, you could really drastically increase this range if you only have like 10 big blinds from the small blind. Okay. Um, all right, so let me just give a few caveats about this. Okay, so actually, I'll, I'll leave it to you guys. Okay, if someone comes up with a very good complaint about these recommendations I'm giving you, uh, I'll, I'll give out the last $20 gift card. Um, okay, so what are some problems, sort of? Okay, so uh, I mean, normally I get lots of complaints in this section. You, are, you already got one, but you can answer. Yeah. Um, you're very predictable, so... Right, okay. Right, good. That, that's a very good point. So a lot of people ask me, you know, why would you follow these? If I follow these, everyone knows what I'm doing. Well, the point is, for most of these, um, for most of these, even this range, right, it sort of encompasses enough hands. So this is where I'm talking about optimal balance play. I think, you know, even though humans haven't solved poker, I think roughly, if you want to ask, you know, I would, I would guess that roughly the optimal range of hands to open from this position is something like this. It's going to be looser, but it's something roughly like this. You know, probably you want to probabilistically play some smaller cards just so when the flop comes 2-2-4, two, two, you can potentially have a 2. But essentially, you're not doing bad here, because if the flop comes 3 small cards, then you're going to be doing pretty well with all your big pairs. And if, and if the flop comes big cards, you still got ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack in your range. Um, so yeah, but, the, but, that, but that is a correct, you know, that is a good, that is a good complaint. And if you, um, so, you know, in theory, it's in theory optimal to play 7-7 seven, seven some fraction of the time, 6-6 six, six some fraction of the time, and like 2-2 two, two some fraction of the time. But that's sort of making things really complicated. And, you know, if I, I don't want to add 2-2 two, two to the list, because if you play 2-2 two, two every single time, then that's way too loose. You're just spewing money by raising with 2-2 two, two against this many players behind. But, you know, so ideally, maybe with 2-2, two, two, you should you should do a random number generator and 10% of the time play 2-2. Two, two. That would probably be theoretically optimal. Um, okay, good. Uh, that would have gotten this, but okay, I'll give it to you. Uh, yeah. I think another problem with playing really tight all the time is that you are also very easily bullied around the table. Right? So if, some, if someone bets and you know you really want to play, you really want to stick to your tight range, you'll fold and you'll maybe miss out on something that you shouldn't have depending on your position and things right. like that. Right, okay, okay, good, yeah. So yeah, so these are pretty tight in that you know, it does give the other people incentive to raise a lot because everyone's going to be folding a lot because they're just waiting for these really good hands. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, that, that's good. So, okay. Are there any other questions about these suggestions I gave you guys, or other other um, other potential complaints? I'm going to give this gift certificate to you unless someone thinks they have a they have another complaint. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to I'll give this to you at the end. Um, Okay, so, all right, so, okay, so this is one thing that I didn't really address. So I talked about, so I talked about going all in as well as just raising. So how do these ranges differ? Um, the, the answer essentially is they don't really differ. So, you know, let's say, you know, here, these are the hands I told you to play, right? Let's say you're sort of small enough, you only have... 12 big blinds with antes, and you're supposed to go all in instead of raise, what, which of these hands do you go all, all in with? It's roughly the same range. Um, so yeah, I think as a decent rule of thumb, if you just go all in with the same range, you're not going to be doing badly. Um, but when the effective stack size is much smaller, like let's say you only have three big blinds, then you can drastically increase this range. Um, okay, so when, you're, when your effective stack size is actually, say, 10, or, uh, or let's say your effective stack size is five big blinds. You know, intuitively, you might think, I can wager a lot. I can wager a lot wider a range of hands. So here's the argument. The argument is, I'm only risking five big blinds. In the other case, I was risking 12 big blinds. Why should I? I should be way more aggressive with five big blinds than 12 big blinds, right? So that's the argument. But the reason why that argument is wrong is because with five big blinds, you're going to get called every time. 
With five big blinds, you can't just go all in with seven two offsuit because your opponent has such good odds to call, they're going to call you. Whereas with 12 big blinds, even though you're risking more, you also have more chances of getting everyone to fold. So even though it seems like you're risking way more, in some sense you're not. Because the more chips you're risking, the more likely it is that everyone else folds. Does that argument make sense to everyone? So make sure you don't get tricked by that because it is easy to get tricked. But the fact that you, the fact that when you have, when you're risking more, you're getting people to fold more means you're actually not risking as much as you think you are, and it's, and that's like a common fallacy. Okay, cool. So, uh, okay, so I'm gonna, so we're near the last part of the class. So, are there any other questions? So I know some of you probably want to start playing tonight, and I definitely did not address uh, and everything you need, um, but. Uh, are there any other questions, roughly in terms of opening and going all in, that you might want to know before, like playing tonight? Because I do think we have maybe five extra minutes, so I can answer some questions. Um, does anyone not know what the term like bluff means? I said bluff a bunch of times, but I realize I never explained. So bluffing essentially means you have a bad hand, and because you have such a bad hand, you know the only way of winning that hand is to get your opponent to fold. So basically, you bet big to hope that your opponent folds. Um, if you have a better hand, like an average hand, often you actually don't want to be betting because there's no point. Because when you bet, you're essentially just getting adversely selected where your opponent calls you when their hand is better and you lose more money to a better hand and your opponent folds when their hand is worse so you're not making any money from a worse hand. And then with your best hands, you want to bet to try to get your opponent to call and increase the amount that you win and we call this value betting. So I'm going to get more into this more into this in future lectures. But essentially in poker, the paradigm you want to play is you want to value bet your very best hands, and then you want to basically check and try to get you show down, like try to show your hand on the river with your medium hands, and then also bet with your bad hands to try to get your opponent to fold better hands. Okay, so okay, I'm going to get to the last part now. Okay, so quick tests. Okay, so here what would you do? It's folded to you, you're in the hijack, you have ace five of clubs. Um, so, someone want to suggest, what, what would you do? What would your play be? Call. Yeah. Raise. Okay, good. Raise. So, so not, not call. That, that, was, that, that was a mistake number one to not do. You always want to raise the blinds if it's folded. But it, it's fine. It's, it's, it's fine. That, that's fine. We're all here to learn about these hands. Okay. Now, should I go all in or should I just raise to, uh, to, uh, to 450? Which is 2.25. I should go all in. So, okay, oh, oh, I think it's not terrible to just raise to 450, but I said if it's 10 big blinds, with, there's no antis, right? So you need um, 10 or less, and you have 10, so going all in, I think, is fine. Okay, so we decide to go all in. Um, and yeah, so, so roughly, this is what, uh, so there are Nash calculators, they're, they're complicated, but if you run this through a Nash equilibrium calculator, this is roughly what you should be going all in with. Um, okay, so we go all in. So this range is a bit different than what I showed you before, because this is this is an actual Nash calculation, just not just my recommendation. It's going to be wider than what you saw before, but that's fine. Um, okay, so now you're this guy, you're seat nine. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do a quick calculation of what equity you need to call here. And I'm going to, um, yeah, so what equity you need to call here. So. A, a straight up pot odds calculation says you're getting 23 to 20 or uh, you need, or 1.15 to 1. So you roughly need 46.5% equity to call as this player. But um, there's two players behind. There's a graphics glitch. C1 has not folded. C1 and C2 both has cards. So you actually need more than 46.5% equity because the calculation of 46.5% assumes C1 and C2 can't wake up with pocket aces. So, you know, you can do, so Poker Silva is very good for this, and you can do this right now. I've taught you everything you need to do these calculations, and Poker Silva is also easy to figure out how to use. Um, you can essentially just plug in, you know, you look at pocket fives, it has 48%, you need 46.5%, and I said you need a bit more than 46.5 due to the fact that there's two players behind, so pocket fives, you know, it's good enough, okay, well, I'll call ace nine suited. I'll call. So I'm just showing you some calculations on poker stoves. It, it really is a really good tool. Um, so you can do some calculations, and you okay. So so basically, okay, the, the they call, um, and the hands I showed you here is actually sort of the worst hands that it's plus CV to call with. Pocket fives, ace nine suited. 
plus, so ace nine suited plus means ace nine suited, ace ten suited, ace jack suited. All the hands that are strictly better than ace nine suited. Ace ten offsuit, uh, king queen suited. Okay, so now as the last player here, do you call with king queen suited? Um, it's just a rough guess. How many of you intuitively would call with king queen suited? So two players have already gone all in. Oh, so most people would fold. Oh, you guys would call. Okay, so. It turns out, at least according to the Nash calculator, which is not... So So here you calculate the pot odds, and this is an exact calculation, because there's no more players behind. So you just calculate, do I have 29.5% equity? Um, and basically, if, you, if I assume that player one and player two are playing according to Nash equilibrium or optimal ranges, you actually have way more than enough. Um, you actually have 34%, where you only need, needed 25%. So this is sort of a trick question I set up. The, 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 the trick was, king-queen suited doesn't seem like a good hand, but against two other hands, it's actually relatively a very good hand. You know, against one other hand, they could just have a pair and you're behind, they could have an ace most of the time and you're behind. But against two other hands, you actually have really good equity. Because when you hit a king or a queen, you have a big pair. You can also hit straights and flushes with king-queen suited. And your equity against two other hands is very good. <coughs> okay, so you have way more than enough, so, so they call. Okay, so, so we're going to get in this all-in pre-fall. Okay, so who are the people I gave these cards to? Um, do you want, so you guys can come up to the front, and I'm going to hand you your cards. The people who I gave these gift certificates to, who I said. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, stay, stay up here, stay up here. Okay, so, so what I want you guys to do is, okay, so these are the hands people went all in with. Okay, so who was the first person to answer? Okay, so you get to pick which hand do you want. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go with Jack Jack. Okay, so uh, Colin. Colin is going to take Jack Jack. Um, okay, sorry, what's your name? Kevin. Kevin. Okay, Kevin, which hand do you want? So he took Jack Jack. Which of these remaining? You were second, right? Yeah, you were. I okay. Last. Okay, which hand do you want? I want King Queen. Okay, so he's going to take King Queen suited, so you're going to take Ace Five of Clubs. Okay, so. So this is okay. This is sort of mean, but uh, this is I want to show you guys. This is how poker works. When you've already won, you've won twenty dollars. Um, so we're gonna, you guys are gonna put your money in, and whoever wins this hand is gonna get all sixty. Because the poker, the winner. So okay. So this. Um, okay. So okay, we're gonna go for it. Predetermined. Okay. So this is the preflop equities. Um, yeah. So it is. It is pre predetermined. Okay. So so it looks like you guys did very well. You guys picked correctly. You got to pick first. You picked the best hand with equity of 34.73. You got 33.95. You're only a bit behind with 31.1. All right. Um, okay, so the flop is 6, 7, 8. So let's look at the probabilities now. Jax is still ahead. Uh, Ace-5 has picked up a lot of outs. Um, King-Queen of diamonds is not looking too good, but they did pick up one diamond. Okay. Darn. Turn is the nine of hearts. Um, so, I'm sorry. Uh, wait, you guys seen Queens? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so you're you're out of the running, and then he needs a tie. Okay, uh, do people want to cheer? Is there any card you're hoping for? <laughs> what are you hoping for? Uh, yeah, I think it's ten or a heart. Oh. Okay, so you want to be screaming? Okay, I'm gonna press it on the count of three. Okay. You want to be screaming ten or a heart? Okay. <laughs> and you want to be screaming? Uh, not not. Anything a else? <laughs> um, oh. oh. Okay, so um, I guess we get all three of this. Um, but there's gonna be more. There's gonna be more of these gift cards during class. So participate in class. You're gonna get uh, gift certificates courtesy of the Cuban Capital. All right, thank you guys.